Let's get uh, started. So, uh, several announcements. Uh, first, we didn't reach the 90% threshold for course evaluation. The final number was 70 something. Uh, but still, I decided to give everyone five bonus points. Uh, next week, we will have the in-class CTF, which is the midterm for this class. I will share more details in this week. There will be four or five challenges for you to solve. And uh, I will modify those challenges based on our homework. So if you understand the homework, you should be fine. Uh, there may be one or two challenges that uh, would be a little bit different from the homework. But if you understand the homework, you should be fine. OK, so today we keep talking about stack-based buffer workflow. Uh, we will talk about how to defend and uh, the research, the deployment we have been using in our systems since the discovery of uh, stack-based buffer workflow. So before that, let me remind everyone what the attacker's goals. So as an attacker, the ultimate goal is to take full control of the victim's computer. Uh, full control usually means can execute arbitrary code. So far in this course, we are talking about executing arbitrary code in user land. We're not talking about executing arbitrary code in kernel level. So you have been injecting shared code, and the shared code inject is play, uh, uh, run as uh, the privileged user. However, it's still a user land code. Um, in some other attacks, we want to get into the kernel, directly execute in the kernel. And usually here, the ultimate goal is to hijack the execution flow or control flow of a program and uh, require attacker to inject some uh, code, malicious code, or, and also abuse the vulnerabilities, bugs, uh, that can redirect the control flow. So usually, to redirect the control flow, we need to alter, change a code pointer in the memory. Uh, so most of bugs we talk about in the class are memory corruption bugs. The bug happens in the memory, doesn't happen in the CPU directly. Uh, there will be one or two sessions we'll talk about micro architecture level attacks at the end of the semester. So in the memory, there are many pointers, borrowing the C concept of pointer. Pointer basically means an address. Um, then there are pointers to data. Those are called data pointers. There are also pointers to code. Those are called code pointers, like the return address on the stack is a code pointer because it's point to another address, and at that address, there are instructions. Function pointers are also code pointers. So in the homework, crack me five, um, you actually overwrite a function pointer on the stack, but you only look at as a binary code. So you probably didn't realize that's a function pointer. So you saw an instruction called EAX there. That's called an indirect call, because the value of EAX is not determined uh, at compile time. It's only determined at runtime. Um, so it's called an indirect call. If the previous one, if you call print secret, call other in the code, a hard-coded address, that's called a direct call. So EAX is obviously, in that case, is a code pointer, but it's not a memory address. It's a register. Um, you want to alter those kind of things to change the control flow. Um, so besides changing the code pointers directly, you can also change other data pointers, which leads to the modification of code pointers. The frame base, the function frame base attack we did two weeks ago um, is, is an example of that. You, you didn't directly change the current function's stack frame, change its return address. You change the upper level function's 
stack frame, and in that stack frame, it has a return address. So you eventually you change the return address. Uh, also, in C programming language, uh, there is an interface called set jump, long jump. Uh, it's architecture specific uh, implementation. So for different architectures, that feature is implemented differently. Uh, however, there will be code pointers to uh, in in those implementation. So set jump, long jump can also be uh, attacked. Also, not on stack, but also on heap or other memory regions, there could also be code pointers. Uh, in the heap exploitation class, we'll talk about how we can exploit uh, heap vulnerabilities. And uh, right now, a lot of kernel exploitations will happen uh, at the kernel heap, or even for browsers, actually the exploitation happens in heap. So uh, we can also exploit other pointers, uh, even if they are not code pointers, even if they are data pointers. We can exploit pointers to uh, read a memory location we are not supposed to read. We can write a memory location we are not supposed to write. And also, uh, like we just said, we can also uh, need the program to redirect to wherever we want. So how do we defeat this kind of uh, buffer overflow? Like all other defenses in security, usually there will be, a, there, sometimes there can be a perfect solution. Uh, it's theoretically correct. It can prevent the vulnerability, can prevent the attack. Uh, like uh, in the buffer overflow, there is a, those, usually those approaches we call a direct defense approach. Uh, they are, they work, they are accurate. The only problem is the, they probably are very inefficient. Uh, they are very slow. Then there are other much simpler approaches which is very computationally uh, affordable. It doesn't introduce much overhead. So today we are going to look at the direct approach and also indirect approaches. Uh, and uh, in the widely deployed uh, approaches we have all in our systems, they are most those indirect approaches. The direct approaches, they exist in theory, they exist in papers, but we don't really see them in uh, real world because they make the system very, very slow. So one of the examples of direct approach is something called the base and bound check approach. So this can actually prevent buffer overflow. So some of you probably heard of new programming languages, something like Rust. So Rust doesn't really use this kind of approach. Rust uses other approaches to, to eliminate buffer overflow. And that happens in compiler time. That's why uh, Rust is taking over the world. It's fast, it's secure. Uh, so before Rust, we have many different indirect approaches we have been using for two decades. Uh, one of them is called stack cookies or stack calories. Uh, this can prevent uh, overwriting, and this is deployed in every of our device, every of our OS and uh, uh, all our apps. So, so far, the applications you have been uh, cracking, exploiting, we disable this. So today, we are going to look at this approach and say how we can bypass this. This is not perfect. Then another approach is what you have seen two weeks ago, which is data execution prevention. Uh, different architectures have different names. Uh, could be NX, could be DEP. They're basically the same thing. The idea is um, some of the memory regions like stack, you are not supposed to put code there. So even if you put code there, we will not execute anything there because everything there should be data. There should be not code. Okay. So the first approach we want to talk about is this base and uh, bound check approach um, to defeat spatial memory uh, overwrite. So the buffer overflow we have been studying is like a sequential overwrite from a lower address to a higher address, right? So this is called a spatial memory safety problem. The heap problem we will look at later 
some of the heap problems, there will be uh, temporal memory problems. You allocate an object on the heap. Uh, later, that object is deleted. However, you still have a pointer pointed to that object. Then you allocate another object there. So uh, the pointer is thinking that I'm still pointing to the original object. Actually, it's pointing to a new project. So it's not a memory. It's not a spatial memory safety issue, but a temporal memory issue. So going back to uh, this spatial memory safety issue, uh, let's say for any pointer in this system, let's say we have a char star A, that's a pointer. For any pointer in the system, under the hood, we will create two more pointers for it. So the compiler can automatically do this. The programmer still only define a pointer A. However, compiler will actually insert two more pointers to it. Uh, one of the pointer points to the lowest address for that uh, pointer, like uh, the base address. The other points to the highest address for that. It's if this one is not A, instead it's a buffer. So that's what we have been used, buff. There is a buffer. Then we define a buffer. The compiler actually define this is the beginning of the buffer and this is the end of the buffer. So right now in the C code, you, we didn't define that. We only define a buffer. We define a size. But under the hood, no one says that we cannot access beyond the size of the buffer, right? So whenever you create a pointer, allocate some memory. In this case, we allocate 112 bytes. Then the base of this were pointed to the beginning of this, so it will be A, and the end of this were pointed to A plus 12. So any access using A as the base address uh, must be between the base and the bound. That's it. That's the rule. The compiler can insert checks before any access of uh, using A, dereference using A. So, so A0, A1, uh, A5, 11, they are all legit. However, if you do A12 or A minus 1, that will be considered illegal. However, in the C implementation right now, you can do A with any number, uh, positive number, negative number. You can do that. So if we define something like that, we also need to define how do we propagate this, because variables will be assigned to other variables. Uh, you have a pointer A, then you can have another pointer B. The one error, a new pointer is assigned, it should, you must also copy the base and the bound for the original pointer. In this case, we define a new pointer B, and under the hood, the compiler has to in, instrument code to copy A space to B space, A bound to B bound. Uh, also, if we have uh, another pointer C, which tries to point to the middle of that B array, in this case, we point to the second element or third element of B, but actually, in this case, C space should copy B's, K, uh, B's uh, base, and the C bound should also be copied from B bound. So you can see this approach. The overhead is actually uh, very big. For any pointer, we need uh, two more pointers. So it's um, twice of the overhead to store a pointer. Uh, also, assignment, previously, we just need one assignment. Now we need to two more assignments, right? Also, for every access, we need uh, some uh, checks to compare if they have, um, they, those are legit. Um, they are legit uh, memory access. So that's why at least two, twice overhead on storing, twice overhead on uh, ch checking, and also uh, assignment. Right, uh, because of that, this is not a very uh, this is not a very practical approach. Uh, there are so many uh, memory copies assignment in the code. So this is actually proposed in a paper published in 2009. Uh, the paper was published at um, PLDI, which is one of the 
top conferences in programming language design. There are two top conferences in programming language design. Another one is uh, POPL. Uh, this one is uh, PLDI, is Programming Language Design and Implementation, I guess. The POPL is Principle of Programming Languages. So those are the uh, top values uh, for programming language research, and those conferences have been there probably for 50 years. So there are other approaches. This is a lot of paper published uh, by the same team, uh, published uh, in a lot of conference called uh, S Plus. So this conference is, uh, is also a top conference in uh, architecture and uh, systems. So ASP is architecture support. Maybe it's architecture and programming language support for OS, or uh, so basically it's um, OS, programming language, and architecture conference. Uh, and uh, this paper, you can say they are trying to use some hardware features to achieve the same thing. However, uh, because it outflowed some of the uh, tasks to hardware, uh, the performance will be higher than the pure software-based approach. Uh, however, those approaches, they exist in papers. They didn't really find their way to commercial products. Uh, next, we're talking about two different indirect approaches. They're not perfect. However, they are very successful. All our systems we are uh, using. Uh, Shadow Stack is the first one. Shadow Stack is not necessarily used in all of our systems, but uh, many systems are using Shadow Stack. Another one where we'll take an uh, even closer look is um, Stack Clary, and that one, uh, all our systems are using that. So I took this picture from a paper from uh, Asia CCS, uh, which is um, an ACM conference in computer and communication security. And this conference is always hosted in some Asian countries. That's why it's called Asia CCS. Um, so in the middle of this figure, you can say this is the our stack, okay? Uh, do not think about the left-hand side and right-hand side, just look at the middle. This is our stack, and we have several function calls, right? So the stack goes from higher address to lower address. This is the first function call, and we have the parameters. Let's say the first function called uh, R1. Um, then there is R0 is a function, calling function R1, calling function R2, R3, then maybe um, calling R3 again. Okay. Let's say, then obviously on top of the stack here we have the parameters for R1, the function R0 calls. Then we have the return address of R0. Uh, then we will have the saved EBP. Uh, then we will have some um, local variables which we omit in this figure. Then Keep going down, we have the stack frame for the second function, the third function, and the fourth function. Uh, and uh, the problem here is some of the buffers, uh, the code may have vulnerability. So we can overwrite, let's say if we overwrite the local variable of uh, here, then we will be able to overwrite everything which has a higher address than this, everything of this, right? Including the return address, including the saved EBP. And the idea of shadow stack is very simple. We still assume the attackers can exploit this vulnerability. The attackers can still overwrite the return addresses. However, we will make another copy of the return address somewhere else. That's it. And we assume that it's much harder to overwrite that address. So there are two different ways to do this. Uh, one is called the traditional shadow stack. Another one is called the par parallel shadow stack. Uh, the difference between them is the parallel shadow stack is a little bit faster, but it also uses much more space. The traditional one is uh, slower, but it only uses uh, very uh, little space. The idea is very simple. 
So the main stack, we're not going to change anything. Uh, the return address is here. Then at another place, somewhere else, where attackers cannot overwrite, we will store another copy of the return address. When we call the second function, do the same thing. We have a another copy of the return address. So when the attacker overwrite the main stack, the traditional stack is not uh, modified. So when we actually, the function returns, instead of using the return address on the main stack, we will use the address on the shadow stack. Or we can also compare those two addresses to say if they, are, if they match. If they don't match, means there has been an attack. Uh, the parallel shadow stack, the same idea. Um, it's just we do not store those addresses together. Uh, we, uh, the return address in the main stack, every return address on the main stack have a fixed distance or offset compared to the parallel channel stack. Later, if you see the code, you will see why it makes uh, the program a little bit faster. So this is the prologue of epilogue, epilogue of the traditional uh, shadow stack. Uh, here, we are using uh, AT&T syntax. So that's why you see the percentage sign here. That's AT&T syntax. And we use uh, GS which is a segment register in Intel architecture to uh, store the shadow stack pointer. Okay, so on top here we have the prologue for the traditional shadow stack, which means at the beginning of each function, uh, besides we have that push EBP, move EBP to ESP, uh, we are going to instrument those four instructions at the every beginning of uh, the fun uh, every function. So first, we subtract uh, GS, the offset 108. Uh, so GS is a segment register uh, where GS points to uh, 108 bytes after. That four bytes, we consider that the value of there, that's our shadow stack pointer. So hardware-wise, we don't have a special register called a shadow stack pointer. We only have a stack pointer, that's a register. So here we just use a memory address, we call that as a shadow stack pointer. Then we subtract that four, so we minus four. Uh, then we move, uh, in this case, we move the first one to the second one. Okay. Um, so we move that at uh, the value of our shadow stack pointer to the register EAX. Then we move whatever ESP points to to ECX. So at the beginning of the function, what does ESP points to? ESP points to, to the return address, right? At the very beginning of the function, ESP points to the return address. So what we're doing here is we're moving the return address to the register ECX. The return address is already on the main stack. We're moving that copy to ECX. Then we move ECX to where EAX points to and EAX points to the GS108 uh, place, right? So that's how we make another copy of the return address at a different memory location. Four instructions to do that. So the epilogue, obviously there are many ways to implement this. We can compare the value in the main, shadow stack, main stack and a shadow stack uh, to say if they match. If they don't match, we can just crash the program. That's one way to do it. A second way is when we return, we just use the address in the shadow stack. We do not use the address in main stack. That's the second approach. The third approach is we can copy whatever is in the shadow stack back to the main stack, then return to that address. So let's look at this piece of code. We are actually uh, copying from shadow stack back to the main stack. First, we move uh, our shadow stack pointer to ECX. So ECX has our shadow stack address. Then we add a four to that, increment that. Then we move whatever it points to, to EDX. So 
the address on Shadow Stack is moved to EDX. Uh, then we move whatever EDX, the, the value in EDX, to what ESP points to. And ESP points to the main stacks and uh, the return address on the main stack. So we, this, this instruction basically overrides that. We don't care what is main on the main stack. We override that. Then we return. So return just takes whatever ESP points to and return to that place. So this is the implementation of a traditional channel stack. As you can see, uh, at least four instructions instrumented at the beginning of a function and also four at the end of the function. Right? Uh, here is another approach. Instead of uh, uh, overwrite, we can uh, check the value, compare the values in the main stack and the shadow stack, and if they are not the same, we uh, just uh, uh, hold the CPU here in this case. Uh, let's say we move the shadow stack pointer to ECX, add four bytes, move the return address to EDX, here we use a compare instruction, compare EDX with whatever in ESP. Then if they are not equal, jump, not zero. So the compare instruction will change the E flex instruction. Uh, and the jump N instruction will have different behaviors depending on what kind of flex is set in the uh, flag register. So if they are not equal, in this case, not zero, uh, then we will go to abort, which is the halt instruction. The CPU will stop. Uh, otherwise, we will continue execute uh, the return instruction. Okay, so that's another different approach for traditional stack. Uh, as you can see, that um, even if there is no attack, okay, every instruction there were every function we will have four more instructions at the beginning. Uh, four more instructions at the end. Uh, if using this approach, will be actually more instructions, six or uh, five or six instructions, even if there's no attack, right? So attack doesn't happen very often, uh, but the overhead is quite high in this case. Uh, that's why um, some people proposed uh, parallel shadow stack, which is slightly uh, faster. Uh, and uh, this is basically the approach of parallel shadow stack. We only need two instructions at the prologue and two instructions at the epilogue. So at the prologue, we still need to move the return address, make another copy to the shadow stack. So what we do is we uh, so the return address points to the return address actually points to um, uh, re re the ESP actually points to the return address. Uh, the pop instruction can actually move from memory to memory. So we use the pop instruction and we pop it to ESP plus a fixed number. Okay, so ESP right now points to the main stack, points to the return address. We pop whatever is there to ESP plus a fixed address. Okay, and that fixed address is our uh, channel stack. And this number can be determined at a compiler time. So since this is a pop instruction, after pop, ESP will uh, increment four, right? That's why we need to do a lot of uh, subtract ESP to make it ESP points back to the return address again. So just the two instructions. So the epilogue, the reverse operation, we add four point to ESP, then we just uh, push what ESP plus that fixed number. Um, so when we to push this, we are going to overwrite the main stack using the value from the shadow stack. So uh, two fewer instructions uh, in prologue and epilogue 
in total four fewer instructions. So you can see that people working on those kind of approaches, they must be very familiar with the instructions. Uh, they find out, oh, there, those are instructions, I can do this a little bit uh, faster in a little bit smarter way. Um, so some papers said that the overhead for traditional channel stack for regular functions will be around 10%. Of course, this depends on your coding style. Some people put everything in one function, right? They, from software engineering point of view, that's a bad practice. But, however, if you write a program that way, the compiler may generate a faster program. Okay. There are not so many function calls. And because of that, the uh, overhead for shadow stack will be lower. There will be fewer functions. There will be fewer uh, pushes and pops from the shadow stack. The parallel shadow stack, the paper report, the overhead is probably uh, 3%. So 3% is still very high. So next, we are going to look at a, a very fast approach. And this approach is deployed everywhere because it's uh, computationally so affordable. It's almost free. Okay. So this approach is called stack canary uh, or uh, stack cookies. Um, I think most people now call it stack canary. Yeah. So this approach was uh, proposed back in 1998. So buffer overflow was discovered in the 80s. We discussed that maybe late 70s, early 80s. And there was uh, an article on the, uh, the, the smash the stack for fun and profit. Uh, that uh, Frank article everyone read, that's probably 80s or 90s. I don't remember, 90s? Yeah. So this paper was published in uh, 98, has been 25 years. Um, in this paper, they proposed a super simple idea to prevent and also detect buffer overflow. Um, this may not be very useful anymore because there are so many ways to bypass this, uh, but it's so uh, computationally uh, affordable. The performance is so high, so adding this, there is no downside of adding this protection, basically. Uh, the idea is uh, super simple. Um, this is a, also a compiler approach. So for developers, you don't need to change your source code. A compiler will just add some instruments, some code there to make it faster. Same as Shadow Stack. This is obviously proposed before Shadow Stack. Um, this will also patch the function prolog and uh, epilog. Uh, the prolog part will just push an additional value onto the stack. And that, st that value is called the kernel okay? So the, the term, the name, obviously, is borrowed from um, the uh, mine industry. In mine industry, uh, you don't know the air condition, whether there are gas in the mine down 100 meters. That's why they bring a bird, they bring a canary, the, the workers, they bring a canary with them. If the canary is dead, they know the gas, there, there is maybe a gas leak. So they uh, go back to the ground, right? So the same idea here. Um, then the epilogue will just check the canary value. If the canary value is changed, uh, then means there is an attack. Uh, we will use the same example we have been using for many different um, uh, scenarios, uh, the over, overflow return four to, to see how this works. So the overflow return four function looks like this. There is a, a volfu which has a buffer 30 bytes in C code level. Uh, it uses the insecure gets function to get input from std in and uh, gets will only stop when there is a new line or there is a zero, I guess. So in this case, uh, we attacker, we will be able to feed the program much more than 30 bytes. And because of that, the main stack of Volfu will be uh, overwritten, and also the main function can be overwritten, right? So 
the left hand side is the version of code we have been you have been uh, exploiting. Um, very simple there. Uh, you look for the function call. That's at line 11 fe. That's the function call to to call gets. And from this one, you can see that uh, from here we can do a backward slicing. We can check the buffer where the buffer is. The buffer is at ebp minus 30, right? The SQL level is 30 bytes. The compiler actually gave us 30 in hex, which is 48 bytes in this case. However, if we compile this version with um, uh, stack cookies, uh, then the code here will be uh, quite different. The main difference is here. Uh, the beginning actually is almost the same. We have this part, that's because um, the uh, program uh, position independent execution program. So this part is not really related to cookies. Uh, here is what, what is related to cookies. You can see that there, the compiler in, instrument instruction to move some value from GS plus 14, that's a memory location, will move the value from that memory location to ECX. Then we'll move whatever in ECX at EBP minus C. Then we will set ECX as zero. So the ECX doesn't have that value. So whatever stored here, that's what we call the curly value. Okay. So after that, we have the original code. So we have the gets here. Uh, the buffer is at EBP minus 34 in hex now. Um, then after the call returns, uh, this gets returns before this function returns. The compiler instrument formal instruction here. The first one is move EBP minus C, that's our corollary value on the main stack, to the register ECX. Then we compare, here we didn't use the compare instruction, CPM instruction, uh, instead we use the uh, exclusive or instruction. Um, if the value they equal, the exclusive or should, the, the result for exclusive or should be zero, right? So the ECX, uh, which is the value from the stack, and also the value at that memory location, GS plus 14. So we exclusive all of them if they equal, we are going to, if they equal, JE, E is equal. If they equal, then we will call, we'll go here. So we'll basically skip the next call instruction. If they do not match, then we are going to call this underscore, underscore, stack, underscore, a check, fail, local function. Okay. That is a C library function. That function, um, well, that function does is uh, handle uh, calorie check failure. It maybe just crash the program, something like that. So that's that's basically how calorie works. Uh, just very simple. So if you don't remember what the GS register is, it's a segmentation register in uh, x86. So this is one of the registers that exists uh, way back in the early days of Intel CPU. Um, probably three, so the Intel CPU started with 8080. That's one of the, probably that's the first commercial CPU from uh, Intel, 8080. Then there is 8086. Uh, then there is 8186, then 82. 86, 386, something like that. So uh, the very early vers version already has uh, CS and uh, DS registers. Uh, maybe 380 and the GS register. Those are segmentation registers. In your OS class, you probably learned that the, uh, also computer organization class, uh, very old CPUs, they didn't really have memory virtualization. There is no MMU, okay? Uh, and uh, the memory address was 16 bits, I believe. 
but some of the registers are were smaller. Uh, so they come up with an approach to address the 16 bits of space using smaller than 16 bits registers. Uh, and uh, CSDS helped to do that. So now, since everything is virtualized, uh, we're not using those segmentation approaches anymore. Um, but those registers still exist, and we use them for different purposes now. So to visualize what happens uh, there, the left hand side, we have uh, the stack of the version without stack cutaway. We know the buffer is 48 bytes away from the saved EBP, right? And uh, the cutaway version, the buffer is 34 in hex bytes away. That's um, 52, 52 bytes away from saved EBP. And uh, we put a cutaway value at EBP minus C, uh, which means in this case, the buffer, we only have 40 bytes. Uh, the SQL level, we ask for 30 bytes. Uh, here, we actually get 40 bytes instead of uh, 48 bytes in this case. So the calorie value is placed between the saved EBP and the buffer. So if you override this, what happens is if you want to override the saved EBP or you want to override a return address, because this is a sequential override, you have to overwrite the calorie value, right? And you don't know what is the real calorie value. So when you overwrite that, you are going to override some different value. And when the function returns, it compares to check if this one has been modified. If this was modified, it will crash the program. So if we go to our server, we check the, let's say, Cookie 34 version. So this one takes input from STD in, right? So we run this. We put a lot of garbage there. This is more than, this is much, probably more than 50, 52 bytes. Uh, definitely more than 40 bytes, right? And because we have this, it's going to trigger that. It triggers the function call to the C library stack, uh, the underscore underscore stack check failure local function. And that function crashes the program and also print out the string uh, stack smashing detected. OK. So this is the uh, compiler protection. Uh, all our programs has right now. Well, we can. Well, let's see. If we only put um, 39 bytes, uh, it should not trigger that, right? This is probably 30 something, right? So if we have 30 something bytes, it will not trigger that. But a little bit more than that, maybe this one will be more than that. Override the return address, no, not the return address. Override the calorie, then it will trigger the stack, um, the, the stack check fail function. However, we haven't talked about how this value is generated. So those functions, they didn't generate the value. They only fetches this value uh, from another place, from GS14, that place. Uh, actually, for uh, the 32 bit version, uh, that value is at this GS plus 14. Uh, for, 30, for 64 bit, the in Intel architecture, that value is at FS plus 28. So if we look at the 64-bit version of the same program. That's the same program, just compiled as 64-bit version.
So you can see here, this is a 64-bit version, and uh, the calorie value is actually stored at a different place, which is FS plus 28. And the calorie value is also bigger. It's uh, uh, 8 bytes. The previous version is only 4 bytes. And you can see the compiler instrument the valve function, but the compiler didn't instrument the main function here, you see? The main function doesn't have to check. Okay. So when I compiled those programs, uh, I used the GCC, uh, and the GCC provides several options to do this. Um, there are options that the compiler can instrument every function. There are options function, uh, compiler GCC will only instrument the functions that has a buffer, like the valve. Uh, there are also, uh, there are several different options. Yeah. So a lot of compiler we usually use, uh, especially for our research, we use LLVM more than GCC. Uh, LLVM and GCC, they almost share the same options. So LLVM also support uh, all those options. So at this address, uh, GS plus 14, FS plus 28, uh, this is actually uh, where Linux uh, for their process processes, they put something called the Thread Local Storage, uh, TLS. Uh, that's where this is stored. So there are many different calories, and the best one is uh, random. Uh, just to put four bytes of, uh, eight bytes of random number there. Uh, however, there are other approaches uh, proposed uh, in the last two decades. Um, also, for example, there is a, a random exclusive or calorie, uh, or just to put all zeros there, or uh, terminator calories as well. Uh, because those functions like gets, they were earned at those terminator characters, not just only zero, but also new lines. Uh, this is one example of terminator calorie, and uh, zero, and the three uh, terminators. For Linux, we are using, actually, uh, all the calories we are using, uh, the least significant byte is zero. Okay. Um, if we debug this program, you will be able to say that. Let's say we do a GDB to, to this program. This is a 64-bit version of the program. We set a breakpoint at valve, and we execute this program. Okay, now we are at the beginning of the program, right? So where is the function to retrieve the calorie? the instruction here, right? This is the instruction to retrieve the curly from uh, TLS. So let's set a breakpoint there. So we are here, we are going to retrieve that. After we retrieve, the value will be in EAX. So we just uh, step one instruction, and now the curly value, right now it's not on stack yet, but it's in the register uh, RAX. So we just print uh, RAX. We can get the query value. As you can see, that's our query value. Okay? The least significant byte is zero. Okay? So all other values are random. Okay? So in this run, you can see the value is DC something, right? So let's try to run this again from the very beginning. Oh, I should set a break. Uh, let's do one more step. Then we print this. Uh, where are we? Oh, I still need to do a continue here. Now we need to do a SI. So this is a second uh, run of the same program, a different process, and you can say the curly value is different. Okay, it's a random value. Okay, so 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 far, what we have saying is 
at the function level, what the instrumentation looks like at the beginning of each function, uh, and also at the end, what does the instrumentation look like, and also if mismatch happens, uh, we call that a stack check fail or stack check uh, local C library function. Uh, we haven't talked about how that value is generated, right? Uh, that value is actually, for Linux right now, that value is only generated once. So for all the functions in the same program, in the same process, they have the same query value. It's only generated once at the beginning of the program. So this, the right-hand side, is the C library function called the libc start main, okay? So some of you may remember this function. This is a function that implemented by C library developers. This function actually calls the developer's um, main function. When you write a program, you develop the main function and all other functions. This function actually calls your main function. So if we copy this link, I, I want to show you the full program here. Yeah. Oh, maybe we can just uh, do this. Oh, okay. Well, the, the reason I always copy is because I use Linux, and the Linux doesn't have a, a good uh, PDF support. So when I click the link, it always crashes the program. That's why I always copy. But uh, this is Windows. It actually works. Uh, okay. So, so this is a library function, libc start main. Uh, this function eventually calls your main function. So at the end of the function, you can see that. Let's go to the end of the function. So the end of the function is actually calling your main function. It's calling your main function, and uh, it set up the argc, argv, and also other uh, environment variables. Okay. So this is a function call your main function, and um, before that, it will call elite function, right? So in your program, you actually saw that there are some uh, elite functions. Anyway, oh, where am I going? Here. So before the program calls your main function, it does a lot of initializations. And one of the initialization here is set up the stack query, which is here. Uh, the version we are using is actually this one. Okay. So first of all, this function has a local variable called stack check guard. Okay, there is no two underscore here. That's not the uh, final canary value. And this value is getting a random number from the kernel. Okay, so this function basically get a random value. So there are many ways this can be implemented. So this thing executed in Usenet. To get a random value, it has to go to the kernel. The kernel provides a random device, right? Like device random or device u random. Those devices can give you a random number. So um, this function can just open that device random, read four bytes. Uh, this, this function can also call other system calls to get uh, four bytes or eight bytes of random value. Anyway, after that, it will get those uh, random value, which we will use them for query later. Uh, then it will set that query value to the thread local storage. That's why we say the query value eventually function fetches that from TLS. And this is a function actually to set up the query value for the TLS. Okay. So that's basically on Linux how this value uh, works. Uh, the downside of this, you can say, only when the program executes at the very beginning, the first time, it has a value. So if the program actually fork, fork to another program, multiple programs, it will not go through this libc start main again. You write a program, you write a fork system call, then 
after the fork, there will be two processes, but each of them will return or will keep executing uh, after the fork function call or system call, right? So the new process doesn't go through the leap C start main again. So the new process doesn't have a uh, new kernel value. And we are going to uh, attack that later. Okay. Okay. So the evolution of a uh, uh this paper was published in 2000, uh, uh, 1998, 1998, and uh, was introduced uh, to uh, GCC first as a patch. Uh, then uh, quickly GCC adopted that. Uh, IBM also developed something called uh, Pro Police. Uh, we are going to say that uh, in a minute. That's basically um, just place the clarity at a little bit different uh, place. And in 2012, uh, Google engineers uh, implement uh, this flag, the stack protector strong flag, um, to, so this one, this is a GCC and also LLVM flag. So this one basically means it will not protect uh, all the functions. It will check the functions that uh, has a buffer. Um, also, most packages in Ubuntu are compiled with uh, the stack protector since 6.10. Uh, Arc Linux itself, uh, oh, the package is also packed with, uh, is also compiled with the stack protector. Uh, and also, the Linux kernels, they can also use stack calories. So when you compile Linux kernel, you can also use this option. However, the difference is um, here, the canary is a global variable in a new process. For the Linux kernel, there is also a calorie value, which is a global variable. Uh, and um, when something, when mismatch happens, we call this function. And this function is a user land C library function. And a Linux kernel, Linux kernel uh, you need to re-implement this function because C, in the Linux kernel doesn't use the C library, right? So in Linux kernel, you need to implement the same function, has the same name, but different uh, mismatch handle. If, for example, if a Linux kernel, the kernel is compromised, then you just uh, crash the whole system. Uh, and uh, the Linux kernel, they only initialize the query value uh, when system boots. So you, if your system never reboot, run there for more than several years, you'd always have the same query value. So it's not that secure. Uh, the same problem happened to uh, embedded systems, like microcontroller systems. So all microcontroller systems, they we can say they only have one process. They don't really have the memory virtualization, they don't have the concept of process, the traditional or modern concept of process. So there is actually just the one query value shared by the whole system. It's not, and also the security of this depends on the entropy of the query value. And uh, uh, we discovered that uh, microcontroller systems, embedded systems, uh, their color value sometimes is just hard coded. It's compile time generated hard coded. Uh, which means it's not even secure. As long as you know what the value is, then you can, uh, you can uh, overwrite that. So here is a illustration of the IBM's idea of uh, uh, pro police. Uh, this is also a compiler compiler-based solution. Uh, Left-hand side, we have the source code. Uh, there is a function. In function, we have an a integer variable, a pointer, three different buffers. Then we have a string copy, and uh, that's where the vulnerability could be. Um, in a, the default layout, the compiler will just allocate uh, space for those variables based on the ordering of their appearance. 
So in the source code, you can say A appears first as a local variable. So the compiler will just put A at a higher address there. Then B lower, C even lower, D lower, right? The problem with this is if we put calorie there, between, if we put calorie between A and the saved EBP, we can still override A and B. Because C and D are buffers, right? We can over, in this case, we can override both C and D, right? So if we put calorie value out of here, then the attacker still can override everything from here to here. So A and B is still not protected. So the IBM um, Pro Predice idea, very simple. We just reorder those buffers, okay? Instead of putting a calorie value at the lower address of each variable, we reorder those variables. We put, uh, even though C and D, they appear uh, later than A and B, we put them at a higher address. So the A and B will be at a lower address of C and D, so even if we can override C and D, we will not be able to override A and B. And the saved EBP and the return address is protected by Calary. So um, modern compilers, they do all kinds of optimizations like this. Uh, the, uh, for example, you have C structure, C class. You have many different members in that structure. In the C code level, you have an order. But after you compile, they are not necessarily at, in the same order anymore. The compiler do all kinds of tricks to make the program faster. And because of that, that will also introduce no, uh, new security problems. Um, okay. So next, uh, let's take 10 minutes break. Uh, when we come back, we will look at how do we bypass uh, the stack query. We come back at uh, 6, 612.
Okay, next, let's see how can we bypass uh, stack query. Um, now you already know that for Linux applications, the query, query value is stored at something called thread local storage, TRS. And uh, that memory location, there's no special access control. So if you can run program in this process, you can actually read that value. Or if this program has some other arbitrary read vulnerability, you will be able to read that value. So uh, one of the um, vulnerability you can do an arbitrary read is something called a format string vulnerability, but we will only talk about that uh, two weeks later, uh, maybe three weeks later. Um, so uh, in today's class, we're not talking about we can somehow retrieve uh, that calorie value. Uh, we just want to brute force this and uh, uh, guess a value. Uh, first of all, like I said, the for 32 bit version of computer, the calorie value is four bytes. But we already know that the significant byte is always zero, right? Which means it's actually only three bytes, 24 bits. Um, so there are just uh, uh, 60 million possible computations there. Uh, if we do not crash the program, we have a way to guess this. Uh, if we one second, we can guess once. Uh, it will still take like 20 days, two, what, 194, almost 200 days to guess the query value uh, for uh, just the four bits of query value. Uh, but actually, there is a smarter way to guess this. Uh, instead of guess those three bytes at once, we only need to guess those values one by one, okay? So we're going to do a sequential overwrite, right? So the least significant byte we know is zero, zero, okay? Doesn't matter. So the second byte, we can overwrite it with something. We do not overwrite anything beyond that, okay? Only override the second byte of the calorie. We overwrite with zero, zero. Then zero, one. Tier 256. 255, right? That's 256 guesses. And uh, 20, 200, sorry, two, 250, oh, that's right, 250, yeah. So in that 256 guesses, uh, 255 of them, we will overwrite that query value, that byte, to a different value, which will trigger the uh, smashing stack detected. Will trigger that. One of the value will not trigger that. That's the correct value, right? Then we guess the third byte. Then we guess the fourth byte. So we only need to guess 768 times. We, don't, we do not really need to guess 60 million times, right? So that's what we are going to do uh, in this class. Um, and like I said, uh, the fork system call, the new process will not have a new query value. It will have the same query value as the old, uh, the parent process. Um, so next, we are going to look at this program. Uh, I wrote this program to this program will create a new process, and uh, we are going to, and this program has a vulnerability, and we are going to um, guess the query value of this program and uh, eventually give us a shell. And um, this program, the architecture is actually similar to something like a web server. So when you have a web server or a TCP server, sometimes you will do a TCP listen, and when there is a new, when there is a new uh, request coming in, your parent process will fork a new process and use the child process to handle that request, right? So uh, this is not a totally made up scenario. Uh, a lot of web uh, web brothers, uh, network programs, they will use the same architecture, may have the same issues. So the main function here is just a big while loop. Uh, if you ever wrote a program in socket, this 
may look familiar. You have a big while loop looking for uh, input. So the beginning of the main function, we just print a new line, then we will fork. Uh, we create a new we create a new process. So here we fork, we create a new process, and uh, the child process will execute this thing, this piece of code, and the parent process will execute this piece of code. Okay? So fork for fork, both of them will both parent and child process were written here, but the return value for fork will be different. In the child process, the fork system call will return zero. And the parent process will return the child process um, PID, I believe. Uh, that's why here, if we check if the return value for fork is zero, it means this is a child process. The, the child process will first print out its own PID, then call the vowful function. This is the right, uh, left hand side, we have the vowful function. We will look at it uh, later. Um, the vowful function, after the vowful function returns, uh, it print out IPT the full, then exit. That's it, okay? So if the vowful function doesn't return, it will wait here until the vowful function returns. The parent process will pr print out its own PID, process ID, then wait for the child process. So the parent process doesn't do anything. Just wait for the child process. The child process will call vowful. Uh, if the child process doesn't return, uh, the parent process will just hold here. Okay? So this program um, will only have two processes, uh, at most two processes, the ch one child and the parent. It will not fork any, any other um, child. Uh, however, when this child process exit, returns, exit, the, child pro the, ch the parent process will be waked up by the OS. Then the parent process will keep executing the while loop, right? So the, char the parent process will fork again, do the same thing. The, child, the parent process will fork the child again. The child will call the Valfu, basically waiting for you to attack it, okay? So because we use fork here, even though there could be many processes created in this process, many child processes created, the parent is always one. They will always have the same curly value. It's a three random bytes we don't know, but we want to guess that. The next Next, let's look at the Valfu function. So here we have Valfu. Uh, Valfu has a local uh, variable, a buffer, uh, 40 bytes here. Then it has a four fire pointer. The Valfu itself is a big wire loop. The wire loop opens a local file from temp exploit. That is a file it tries to open. So that is basically where you want to put your exploit. Uh, uh, if this is a web or network program, then it can just uh, get input from some socket, right? Uh, same idea. Uh, if this file doesn't exist, try to open this file. If it doesn't exist, it will just break. Uh, it will just, uh, um, oh, sorry, not doesn't exist, does exist. So if the open is successful, it will just break. It will keep running. If it's not successful, it will go back here. So this is kind of like a kernel spin locks there. I'm just uh, uh, spinning here and checking uh, if this file exists. Okay. So if the file exists, exist, it will try to uh, read the file, the content in the file. The file is called uh, uh, temp exploit. Use fread to read the file to a global buffer and uh, it will print out the child process reads how many bytes and the guest clarity value is what what, okay? Um, it will print out what is the clarity value you are trying to guess. Uh, then it will do a memory copy from the global buffer to the buffer on the stack. That's where the um, 
the overflow, the buffer overflow stack based happens. Uh, after that, it will close the program. It will remove this file. Okay. So, which means um, your exploit needs to needs to write your exploit to. You need to write a program to write your exploits to this file, and uh, the child process will read this file, try to say if it crashes. If not, it will delete the file and uh, return, and it will print IP to the full. Then the parent will create a new process, a new child process. Uh, if uh, your guess is not correct, this child process will print out smashing stack discovered, and it will exit. Then the parent process will also create the new, um, create a new child process, right? So that's basically the program. Uh, any questions here for this program? This is probably the most complicated programs we we took a look so far in this class. Any questions? Okay, we're well, good. Okay, so this is a stack of uh, Volfu. Uh, we have return address, save the EBP. Uh, the buffer is actually at, uh, this is from the disassembly. Um, you want to verify this, you can use OBJ dunk. The buffer is at EBP minus uh, uh, 58. Calorie is placed at EBP minus C. Okay. So if you want to guess the calorie, you need, uh, which means C is 12, right? So the whole thing is 52. Uh, this part is 12, which means the buffer is actually 40 bytes here. Uh, so if you want to guess the query, you need 40 bytes of garbage. Uh, then the first byte is 0, 0, so you don't need to guess that. Then the second byte, you need to guess from 0 to uh, FF in hex, basically. Um, so this is a very simple, um, partially done uh, exploit I wrote. And um, your job in the homework is to uh, complete this. And also, uh, this is a semi-automated uh, exploit. I'm going to show you later. This is semi-automated. Uh, if you extend this to uh, fully automated, you just uh, run this program, then eventually you crack the program, you cra crack the parent or child process, then you get 15 um, bonus points for this one. So what I'm going to show you is a semi-automated approach. And the exploits are very simple. This is, uh, this is a Python 2 script. Uh, first of all, there is a, this is a variable. Uh, the range is from 0 to FF. This is basically uh, one byte. Then we first check if the under the temp exploit, whether that file exists. Uh, if that file already exists, means that program we are trying to attack hasn't deleted yet. So we just uh, sleep for one second. Okay. Otherwise, we create a new file called exploit, and we are trying to write our exploit here. And our exploit, like I explained, 40 bytes of garbage, right? Then should be another one byte of zero, zero. Uh, then we can, uh, using this for loop, to uh, guess this query value. So let's do this on our server. Uh, also, we need to put the share code here first. How do I close this? Okay, oh, yeah, doesn't matter. Let me copy this part first. Let's copy our share code. So this is the long share share code, which directly read from flag and print out.
So let's just go to the 32-bit version of this because the clarity value is only three bytes. It will be faster for us to crack this one. The same principle to crack the 64-bit version. So here we first uh, set up our, uh, let me remove this. Let's put a huge knob set there, uh, one twelve hundred, I guess. Okay. Oh, there is a eight level here. Okay. So now we have our share code in the environment variable. Right. Then we can get roughly where it is. S code. Uh, that's our address D nine E five. So for this one, we actually need the two terminals. So I use Tmax, then use control B percentage sign. We have two terminals. Uh, the one terminal, we are going to run the program we are trying to attack. Another terminal, we are trying to run our exploit script. Okay, so here, we are going to run this program, bypass 32 bit. So when we run this program, you can see that it hangs there, right? That's because we go to the source code. So the parent process print out its PID, then wait for the child process, okay? So you can see parent process has a PID 61. The, the child process also print out its PID, then calls powerful. And Valve, there is a for loop. It's looking for this temp exploit file. Right now we don't have that file. And because of that, both of them are just uh, uh, hung there, right? So let's say if we, so when we go to this terminal, it's we um, echo something to that temp file. Temp uh, exploit. Let's just uh, echo some something, whatever, some random stuff. So now we are writing that file, something to that file. And the child process is going to read that, right? So if we do this, we can see that on the left-hand side, the child process read six bytes. We actually put five bytes there, but I think the six bytes might be the ending zero there. And uh, we didn't really guess any query value. That's why it says zero. Okay, so after that, the child process exit. The main process create another child process. That's why the new child process has a PID 63. So if we do a PS here, we should be able to see those ones. Uh, you can see we have two process, buffer overflow bypass calorie. One is 61, another one is 63. So if we write something much longer to uh, trigger that uh, buffer overflow like this. Uh, you can say child process reads 70 bytes and the guest query is 73, which is S here, I guess. Uh, and the child process detect there is a buffer overflow. So stack smashing detected, child process terminated, then parent process create a new child process, which is 65. And all of them have the same query value. So no one right now knows the canary value. I don't know the current value because it's a random number, right? So what we want to do is we want to write a program to guess that. Um, let's say we have the script here, the semi, the semi automatic script. So first we go to the temp folder. That's where you can create files. You cannot create files some other places. Uh, you can use whatever tool you want to use. 
this one let's call it e dot python let's do it that way then uh, we copy this one ooh when I copy like ooh this is terrible I'll have to fix that uh, it should be here right the 4 should be here oof it's terrible when, when we copy we lost that F close will be. What? Hold on. The F Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, should be this way, right? This way. Yeah. So, so F right will be the same. Should be okay. Four. This looks good. Oh yeah. Okay. So we need to solve this. Okay. That looks good, I guess. Is there something wrong? Where? Your open, your F schools are now in the wild. Oh. Okay, so open, right, close should be here. Okay, that looks good. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, now we need to, so this program is not a program yet, right? We need to change mode plus X there to make it executable. Now we can, so what did we do in the program? So this program basically right now we write to that file and we are um, writing 40 bytes of A, then we are guessing from zero to 255 for the first byte. But we already know that that byte is zero anyway. Anyway, we can still do this. Um, then we execute this, then the left hand side, we will say we are guessing. Okay, so let's stop it. Actually, we we got it. So here, um, control B. You can say here. So we we already know. We already know that first byte is zero, right? So when we guess that first byte is zero, it only shows IPT the full. It didn't show stack, smash, and detect it, okay? Because we were able to override the very first byte, which is zero, we, well, then we write zero again, so it doesn't change anything. And because of that, the program, uh, the Volfu function returns successfully. When it returns, it shows I, uh, it print out PT the full. Yeah, if it has some any other any value, it were, Basically, the program will crash here, so it will not show IP to the full. That's why in other cases you can say, didn't show IP to the full, instead show stack, smash, and detect it. Right? So, but that byte we already know it's, um, so left hand side, we, not, we were not, uh, we were not stop terminate that program. Uh, right hand side, we're going to change the script a little bit. Okay, we already know the first byte is zero zero, so we just put zero zero there. Um, that should be the correct syntax, I guess. That should be correct syntax. Okay, now we run this program again. So now we are guessing the second byte, you can see. So if you, if you guys say it's the canary value, the correct one, Say so it's print out the IP to the full, let me know. So we are guessing O D O E of them. So the last byte is zero zero. We are not guessing that one anymore.
So if we find that value, I will terminate the script on the right-hand side. The program we're trying to attack still execute on the left-hand side. We have guessed uh, more than one third of the space. Almost halfway. 7F should be half. <laughs> We're not lucky this time. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, as long as our script doesn't have a bug, I mean, it should show up. Yeah, it could be FF. Um, I didn't really pay attention to zero, 00, but I guess it's not zero, 00. Got it. Okay, so the value is B2, right? So obviously, uh, in your homework, you try to make this automatic, so your program should read the output from the left-hand side. And uh, when you find the value, you just uh, add it here. So here we have B, B2. Then we guess two more bytes, then we're done.
So you say the parent process was never, oh, we actually got it. You guys are not paying attention. Yeah, let me see where it is. Uh, it's probably 60. Uh, where is it? 61. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, 85. Okay. Okay, so we got the third byte with 85. Okay, last byte. Oh, I should. Uh So you can see the child, the parent process um, is still the very first one. The PID didn't change. We didn't get a new child parent process. We got it. Here, A3, right? Okay, so now we go back here. So the last byte is A3. Okay. So what should our export look like? Technically, from here, we only need to send out one export. Okay, so go back to the slides. We have the buffer, 40 bytes of garbage. We have the four bytes of calorie. Then how many garbage bytes we need between the calorie and the saved EBP? What? Eight bytes, right? Because this one is four bytes, and from here to here is, say, 12. So with eight bytes of garbage, then another four bytes of garbage for this one. So technically, we need the 12 bytes. Then we need the return address. That's it. So the return address of our share code. So we need uh, we need another eight, 12 bytes, right? 12 bytes of garbage. Then we just need our uh, the share code address. Um, so let's take a look at the share code address. 
Oh, where, where did we put that? Um, So that's our share code address, roughly D9, D0. We have a huge knob slot there, so we just can add several by several hundred bytes there. Um, D line something, so we just put the DA. I think that's safe. No, should be DA should be the second byte. DA then FF FF. So we only need to send this once, but this script is going to send that multiple times. Okay, let's send the final exploit to the program. Let's see. So that's how we got the flag. So basically, we exploit the child process, not the parent process. Okay, make sense? Cool. This is one of my favorite demos for the whole class because I don't have to do much, just to wait there. <laughs> okay, so um, that's basically what you need to do uh, in the homework is to try to extend this to fully automate it, then you earn 50, 15 bonus points. Okay, let's go over the homework today, then we will be done for today. The homework today actually is quite simple uh, because I want to give you guys more time to prepare for the meter. Um, I do not plan to give extension for this homework um, because working on this homework can also help you prepare for your midterm CTF. Uh, the midterm CTF will be just three or four challenges, like I said. Uh, uh, some of you come to my office hours, uh, I say you got flag, but I also get the feeling that you didn't understand how you get the flag. Um, so for midterm, the key is to, for all the homework, the key is to understand how you get the flag. As long as you understand that, the midterm should be easy. But if you do not understand that, you may spend hours there and ha has no idea what's going on, right? Um, that, that's basically what's hacking about. Um, most of the hacking we are doing, uh, the time consuming part is to understand what's going on. As long as you understand, uh, everything will be uh, quite easy. So the homework this week is to just to Google what is the fork system call. Uh, many of you already know that from your previous classes. And also a simple, very simple program and tell uh, how many um, processes uh, this program will create. Uh, then it's just the demo I showed you just now. Uh, you need to do this, uh, obviously, by yourself. Uh, we, because it's a random category value, if you have a category value, same as someone else, we know you are cheating, right? Um, also, like I said, 15 points builders if you write the fully automated script to do this. Um, last year, I think at least a ton students were able to write a fully, uh, fully automated script. Uh, there are many ways to do that. Uh, there are also some libraries you can use. Um, in our server, I, I think we don't have um, pun, pun tools. Do we have pun tools? Oh, we don't have pun tools here. So that will make sense easier. But we, even without that, yeah, you will be able to do this. OK, any questions for today's class and also CTF, midterm? Yes, um, it will be um, two hours, 40 minutes. Uh, I don't mind to go beyond that, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, for some of you, 
you understand what's going on, you will be able to finish that in 30 minutes. It's not a time, right? If you cannot figure that out in two hours, 40 minutes, you probably cannot figure it out in two days, right? That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, it's open book. Um, you have internet. The only thing you cannot have is ChatGPT, and you cannot talk to anyone in the class or outside class. You, you cannot send the code or binary to someone else and ask them to crack for you, obviously. Um, you cannot talk to your labor here to share the script, uh, exploit. That's not, and also you cannot use ChatGPT. Uh, I'm not saying ChatGPT can't crack it. I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, I don't. I I don't know what ChatGPT can do at this moment. But uh, yeah, for homework, I did allow you guys to use ChatGPT. But uh, um, well, not just ChatGPT. Okay, all large language models. So yeah, everything else, video, lecture, notes, uh, the previous homework. Yeah, everything is uh, public, uh, open. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, if no other questions, uh, see you next week. Uh, I will send out more details this week regarding the CTF.